we turn our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. It's found in four, page 425 in your pew Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We'll read that chapter and we take as our text for the sermon the last two verses of the chapter. First Samuel 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, unto her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken, and Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their home to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou hast weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode, and gave her son suck, until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks, and one ephah of flour, and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock, and brought the child to Eli. 
And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. We read God's word that far. As I say to we take as our text those last two verses of the chapter. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. May God bless his word to our hearts. Beloved, in our Lord Jesus Christ, there are many concerns as we as parents take up the responsibility of training children in these evil days. We look around us and we see how quickly our society has forsaken God's word and God's commandments. We witness a refusal to submit to the clear teaching of God's word and even a ridicule and a mockery that is brought against those who are willing to submit and to insist on obedience to the word of God. And we realize as parents that our children are going to face even greater opposition than we. How will they be able to endure? It's important that we view our children as those who have been entrusted to us for a time from God. Our calling is to do our utmost to prepare them and to teach them for the spiritual challenges that they will face. And that involves the training in the home, membership in a faithful church of Jesus Christ, and our commitment to give them a good Christian education. Our children are not our own. They belong to God. And God entrusts them to us for a time, giving us the calling to train them up and to raise them as those who are to be returned to the Lord. Hannah took that calling seriously. And the great need of our day is for godly leaders, for godly young men who are willing to govern Christian homes, willing to serve in office as elder, as deacon, as pastor, should the Lord call them. For godly young women, capable of standing against all the pressures of society and willing to devote their lives to being godly wives and mothers of Zion. The need in Israel was great for godly leaders. Hannah understood that need, and it moved her to pray this petition. We also desire children for the purpose of the glory and honor of God. Sometimes it's important for us to ask that question. Why do I desire a child? Why do I want children? God gives us here in Hannah an example of that which is to be our attitude with regard to our children. Now, we know that Jesus also informs us in Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38, that there is going to be a shortage of pastors as long as he tarries. At any given time in history, the laborers are few, whereas the harvest is plentiful. And God intends to do that for a purpose, to keep his church dependent upon him for laborers. God alone is able to call men, and God alone is able to put men into that important work of the ministry. What are we to do about it? We're to pray. Synod, in 2019, again, instructed the churches to make this a matter of fervent prayer. We know God must call a man, and God alone is able to place upon that one the burden of the call. God uses means. And what is evident from our text here is the means of a godly wife and mother the means of a godly husband and father. We find find Elkanah not objecting to what Hannah here has pledged to do, but going along, praying for a child for the purpose of preserving the ministry of the gospel in Israel. Praying for a child with that purpose of 
the Lord and his work being continued in his church, praying that God will grant unto us godly sons and godly daughters to continue that important labor to which God calls us until Christ returns, especially in the context here, sons for the work of the ministry. We look at this passage under the theme, Returned to the Lord, noting the prayer, the service to which Samuel was called, and finally the blessing that Hannah herself experienced. For this child I prayed. That's a prayer that resonates with many of us as parents. For this child I prayed. Hannah was barren. She saw her situation from the Lord, as is evident that she looked to God in her need, and she cried out to Him. But as she confessed the sovereign act of God in closing her womb, she yet turned to Him in prayer, knowing that He was the only one who would be able to open that womb, the only one capable of turning the situation around. Hannah's prayers were not simple prayers uttered without meaning, They were sincere. They were fervent prayers rising from a heart that loved God. That love of God that Hannah had is evident from the context here. She responded to Penina in a godly way, even though she was crushed by the unjust treatment that she was receiving at the hands of this woman who's identified here as her adversary. She didn't become guilty of having a vengeful spirit from what we have recorded here. Hannah had no one that understood her. That becomes evident from her husband's flippant response to her. Am I not better to thee than ten sons? He was a polygamist, insensitive, who contributed, it would seem, to Hannah's problems in the home, even though he loved her. But when Hannah now comes to God in prayer, she doesn't come in bitterness of soul. We read in verse 10, that she was in bitterness of soul. But she refrains from expressing that bitterness to God and to others. This is one of the great tests of godliness. When God's providence is upon us in ways that we would not desire, the temptation is to take that bitterness and to turn it again back to God or to express it to those around us or to publish it on Facebook. But by God's grace, we guard our hearts, and we guard that bitterness, and instead we cry out to the Lord. Now Hannah doesn't use her prayer either, it would seem, as a means to vent her anger, to vent her bitterness. She doesn't use prayer as a means simply to try to get her will. Hannah shows here a desire to wait on the Lord and to trust in Him. And in the process of this prayer, she makes a vow before God, as expressed in verses 11 and 12. This vow, again, expresses her faith in Jehovah. She asks for a man-child. And she doesn't do that for herself personally, but she does so for the sake of the glory of God, that this man might be involved in the service of the Lord. The glory of God is on the foreground here. Hannah is not just looking at her own barrenness. She's looking at the barrenness of Israel. And as she looks around her, godly leaders are very few. There were few spiritual leaders in Israel to lead in the way of godliness, in the way of righteousness. This time period of the judges had been a dark time. Every man doing what was right in his own eyes, pursuing their own will, not submitting to God's will. And God's revelation was almost non-existent. Those who were willing to submit to God's will and to follow God's commandments were few and far between. Where were the leaders committed to God and to His glory? Where were the leaders who were desirous to lead the people in righteousness and in holiness? The leaders were corrupt for the most part, and they were given over to the pursuit of their own selfish ends. Hannah wanted a man-child who would be a spiritual leader in Israel. That was the great need of the church of her day. And God so moved this woman that she loved the church. 
She loved Israel. She loved the people of God. And she loved the truth. And she prays and makes a vow. Should God provide her with a son, she will return that one to the Lord to be active in His service. His whole life. Now, beloved, God works in the hearts of godly men and women. This spiritual understanding and this desire. Again, we ask the question, why is it that we desire children? Is it just for our own selfish benefit? For our own selfish pursuit? Or is it for the sake of the glory of God and for the good of His kingdom? God works in the hearts of men and women. That desire for children for the glory and honor of God. And God places children in the homes of devoted Christian parents to train them and to raise them and to equip them for a life of service to Jehovah God. From early on, those children are taught the will of God. Taught not their will, but God's will must be done. When they walk in selfishness, they're disciplined for that selfishness. When they rebel and throw a tantrum, they're disciplined for that. And they're taught, life is not about you. Your life is about God. It's about the service of your Lord and King. And they're taught God's Word educated in the truths and promises of God's Word in order that they have a complete understanding of Scripture not only, but then are given a good instruction with regard to the things of this life and the way in which they're able to use their gifts then and the service of God and the pursuit of His kingdom so that they are taught to know the will of God and to walk therein. And they're given no excuse for their pursuit unrepentantly in sin. They're taught the blood of Christ and the wonder of forgiveness through Christ alone and salvation through Him alone. From early on, God is pleased to grant godly parents who train up their children in that way. They do so with fear and trembling, realizing they themselves are sinners, realizing that we are not capable of this high calling and crying out for mercy to God who alone is able to equip and to strengthen us for this work. But God is pleased to raise up out of our sinful homes leaders, godly leaders, for the sake of His church and for His glory. God is pleased to raise up godly men, godly women, in order that His name might be exalted and magnified here on earth. The circumstances of Samuel's birth reveal that God here is at work despite all that's evident in this family. And again, while there is much that's negative in this family, there also is that which is positive. God is working for good. And God is working and demonstrating that salvation is all of God. God is the one alone who is able to raise up leaders out of troubled situations. And God uses all the circumstances in our lives also for good. If Penina had been kind to Hannah, Hannah may never have gotten to this point where she had made this her prayer. It was the harshness of Penina that drove Hannah to her wrestling with prayer as God uses trials in our lives to drive us to pray like otherwise we never would. Elkanah sinfully took to himself a second wife. The elements that aggravated Hannah's trial were means God is using her now to pursue His will and to know joy. I'm sure Hannah was not able to see that as she finds herself in such a difficult situation. But later on, by God's grace, no doubt she could look back and she could see how God's hand had been there for good. God able to do far above that which we imagine, able to work all things for good. 
The home in which Samuel was raised was a religious home. That becomes evident here in the passage. This man went up out of his city, verse 3, yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. It was a home in which outward duties of religion were attended to. The moral tone was not as it ought to have been, with polygamy evident. And while many in Israel did give themselves over to polygamy, those homes did not enjoy unity. There was not peace. But as stated, Elkanah is not objecting to what Hannah had stated. This was his child as well. And yet he's willing to go along with the vow that his wife has spoken before God. God works in the hearts of his people today, similar concerns and prayers. The great need of the church of Jesus Christ in our day is for faithful laborers who will preach the gospel of Christ crucified for the glory and honor of God. There are hundreds of laborers laboring in the harvest, as there were during the times of Jesus and during the times of Samuel. Chief priests, Pharisees, Sadducees, those who were Levites, but given to the pursuit of their own traditions, their own wisdom, their own will, and their own work, rather than the will of God. Today, the great need is for ministers and for missionaries who labor in God's harvest for the glory and honor of God. The need is for men that care little about themselves, but hold God in high regard and God's will. There are those who are willing to fleece the flock for their own promotion. Those who are interested in their own promotion or interested in the fame and honor that this earth or men would provide. But the need is for men like Samuel. Samuel stands out here as a bright shining light in this history by the grace of God. He would be the last of the judges. And in a sense, the first of the prophets. One who would not rule with physical might and physical strength, but one who ruled with high spiritual qualifications and prayer. He would lay the foundation for change from a republic to a a monarchy, preparing the way for a rule which would involve a king. And this would prepare Israel as a time of transition. God raised up Samuel for this purpose, a man who loved the Word of God, who was preparing Israel for that theocracy. God already ruled, and as God would rule now through men. Now, as godly parents, we pray that God continue to provide us and our congregation with children, not just for our selfish desires, but for the sake of of the glory of God and the good of His church and the good of His kingdom. We bring forth children for the glory of God. And one of the most important ways in which we pursue the work of God's kingdom is bringing forth children, overcoming our own selfish considerations that we as parents might use to limit our family size and bringing forth children for the glory of God and for His honor. Confessing it's not our work, it's not our doing. God alone is the one who's able to work conception. And we find ourselves entirely dependent upon Him. Praying that God will grant us that gift of conception, the gift of children, so that His name might be glorified in and through our seed. And God alone is able to bless such prayers. Conception, again, is not work of man. It's God's work. God heard Hannah's prayer. And God opened her womb for his own glory. And God gave Samuel to the church through the means of this prayer and this vow of Hannah. We reject all inclinations toward bargaining with God or bartering with God. God's not one with whom we barter in any way. Hannah here was not bartering or bargaining with God. Her child already would be a Levite. Therefore, would serve in the tabernacle of God already. But two things are now established through this vow. First of all, he would serve from youth. 
Generally, the Levites would only serve for a few months of the year throughout the course of their lives. Samuel would serve permanently. And secondly, he would be a Nazarite. That one who is consecrated to God and therefore had to keep himself from strong drink, from touching a dead body, and from any kind of a scissors coming to his hair. Samuel and Samson are the only two recorded Nazarites for life. There's a significance then, beloved, to the prayer here and the vow of Hannah. God always teaches us that salvation is all of Him. And now God would show, too, that the maintaining of His covenant people would be His work alone. From an outward perspective, it seemed as though everything was despairing in Israel. Eli was old. His sons were men of Belial, according to chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. From an outward perspective, it would seem as though leadership in Israel now was at a tremendous crisis. It would seem as though the hope of the faithful was waning and would be lost. But Jehovah God demonstrates His faithfulness, as always, and teaches us that salvation is all of the Lord. Just as Isaac was a wonder from God in the old age of Sarah, so now Samuel would be a wonder from God, from Hannah, a barren woman, And God would preserve the revelation of His Word in Israel through this wonder. He would raise up a godly leader out of a divided home from the womb of a barren woman. And God would use the spiritual graces worked in in Hannah to prepare Samuel for this important calling. God would preserve His church. And He would do so by raising up Godly leaders in His providence. We see here the service to which Hannah was called. He shall be lent to the Lord. Hannah, concerning this son, says in verse 28, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. Now literally the idea there is, He whom I have obtained by petition shall be returned to the Lord. This involved tremendous personal sacrifice for Hannah. She confesses this son is not hers. Now that's important for any gift that we give to the Lord. If we are to give to the Lord without pride, we need to confess that what we have is not ours think that what we have is ours, then we're filled with pride about the gifts that we give to the Lord. Whether it be our money, our time, whether it be our sons for the ministry, whatever it might be, we boast and we're filled with pride because we gave that to the Lord. We look down on others even, perhaps, because we think they didn't give what they should or could have to the Lord. Beloved, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7 is always important for us to keep in mind as we give of our time, our money, our children for the sake of God's labor. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? All that we have belongs to the living God. Her son was not hers, but belonged to God and would belong to Israel. Now, Hannah is not called in the Bible to be an example of how one rears and brings up a child, even though her influence on Samuel in those early years was phenomenal, and it had to be exemplary. Nevertheless, Hannah is chiefly put in Scripture as an example of how one gives up her child for the sake of the Lord. This is a truth that... As parents embrace in humility, our children are not our own. Our children do not belong to us. They belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with His precious blood has bought them 
and paid the price of their redemption. We don't have a right then to train up our children any way that we desire. We stand before God with a calling. We stand before God with a duty. These are His children. He's merely entrusted them to us. And we then must bring them up and train them according to His will. The question of where we're going to send our children to school, how we're going to bring them up, is not a difficult question as we stand before the consideration of Jehovah God and His will. The expense of tuition isn't even a concern or a factor to consider when we come at it from this perspective. They aren't ours to do as we would desire. They belong to Jehovah. And our money is not ours. It also belongs to God. God is providing all for the sake of His glory and for the pursuit of His kingdom. Every one of our children must be brought up and trained for a lifetime of service to God and for the sake of His kingdom. Now, as parents, we know our sinfulness and we know our limitations. God alone is able to forgive us and God alone is able to raise up from among our weak, sinful homes pillars for His glory and to show forth His praise. And God alone is able to preserve His church from among our offspring. We look to Him and we trust that He is able to do far above that which we can even imagine. We train up those children. We pray over them. We teach them from early on. Now, sometimes we ask ourselves as parents the question, why is it sometimes that our children, whom we've prayed over, whom we've taught and we've trained, why is it that they forsake the Christian faith and follow after the ways of the world? And we know the ultimate answer has to do with God's decree of election. God doesn't promise to choose to Himself every one of our children. The fact that God is pleased to choose any of our children is a wonder of God's grace. God's will is that which we always stand before. But even as we do so, there always is reason for us to look at our own lives and to evaluate our parenting, to pause and to look at what we're doing, to ask God for forgiveness and to cry out for mercy. There are times when parents are setting before their children things that are valid. Work hard. Be successful in the midst of this world. And yet then those children take those instructions and they go a direction that is very different from pursuing the glory of God and the way of Jehovah. Their beauty, their talents were adored. They were directed to attain wealth. They were set forth how nice it is to live in a beautiful home. And so easy it is for us, even without trying, to set before our children early on the fact that glory and fame and large houses and comfortable income and weekend lake homes and abundant spending money, that's what life is all about. Instead of the importance from early on, life is not about you. Life is about God. It's about His glory. And that means that our lives are going to be about suffering. They're going to be about sorrow. It's not going to be about having always abundant spending money. It's not going to be about having our will with regard to a large home or an easy life. We anticipate the glory that awaits. And we train up our children as pilgrims, as strangers. Now Shiloh is not a good place for a godly child to live. As we noted in chapter 2, verse 12, we read, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the way they were conducting themselves in Shiloh was sinful. They were guilty of gross sins. Eli was old. He was feeble. The atmosphere here in Shiloh is offensive spiritually. Every sin imaginable is being pursued by these wicked men, these sons of the priests. They're violating the priesthood. They're stealing from the sacrifices. It's striking that 
Later on, we read in verse 17, Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Into this environment, Samuel is brought at a very early, tender age, exposed to gross sin from childhood. But God preserves his child in his service. Hannah's self-denial, her trust in God, is a wonder from God. But the faith that God worked here and the wonder by which God preserved his own is that which we as parents also take heed to. As we send our children off to their first jobs, as we send them to school, we send them to college, as we help them establish their own homes, apart from God's preserving grace, all is in vain. But God is faithful. God is able to preserve his covenant. God is able to preserve our children in the midst of these wicked times when they're going to be required to have to work next to those who are living in a completely God-dishonoring manner, called to have to be a witness in the workplace. God alone is able to preserve and keep them, even as he did little Samuel. But more specifically, beloved, our churches, as we stated, need ministers and missionaries. And God will grant unto us this gift in the way of prayer, in the way of godly parents training up their children, in the way of the truth. God is able to raise up men outside of the sphere of the covenant, as he has done again and again. But God is also most often pleased to raise up young men within the sphere of of His covenant. Now, we don't hound our sons, but we teach them God's Word. We teach them the importance of the church. We teach them the importance of pursuing God's will as that which is most important in their lives. And we demand of them that they must prayerfully consider whether God has given them the gifts necessary for the ministry. We need to pray for our sons that God will give them clearly to know His will in their lives. And that if God is pleased to call them into the ministry of the gospel, God also will grant them the grace that they stand in need of. And we pray that prayer in submission to God's will. We pray it with fervency. We support that prayer with our godly instruction and training. Now Samuel here was dedicated to the service of God in the most intimate way possible. He would stand in the house of God and he would serve God in his word. From early on, he understood that. As he stood before God, what was important for him to ask was what God's will was and what God's word was. And he was committed then to sending that word forth. He looked to God and he found from God the grace and the strength that was necessary. His life, from early on, was filled with difficulties. His first word, that he receives from God is a word of judgment on the house of Eli. And as a young child, he has to inform Eli of the fact that God's judgment is coming upon his house because Eli has not disciplined his sons as he ought. Israel is going to reject Samuel in their desire for a king. Samuel understood his calling to be a dedicated soldier of Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, our sons, our daughters, recognize that life in the midst of this world is going to be filled with challenges. But they press on, believing themselves to be faithful soldiers of Jesus Christ, called to show forth His praise. And we trust God to continue to raise up from among our godly young men, pastors and missionaries, We live in a day when there's less and less respect for the office. But God is pleased to preserve those whom He calls. Persecution is going to begin with those who are on the front lines of the spiritual battle. The disciple is not above his master. Jesus was hated and despised. But the way to the call presses men into the labor and assures them that Jehovah God is the one who will preserve and keep them. They take up that service with joy, with thankfulness to God. 
not for personal gain, but for the glory of God. And we see that in young Samuel from early on. As long as he liveth. We read that as we read the chapter repeatedly. That was not the word of Samuel. Samuel didn't make that commitment. Hannah made that commitment on his behalf. As long as he liveth. The truth of God of all ages lived in the heart of Hannah, his mother. Once a minister of God, always a minister of God. This wasn't just a temporary leading. It wasn't a temporary lending to the Lord. This was a permanent returning to the Lord. Hannah had done what she could to prepare Samuel for this service, as is obvious from the context. But then, once she weaned him, she now brings him to the tabernacle. And she'll only see him once a year now, going forward. When Samuel hears the call of God again and again, he listens and he's taught, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And that becomes the theme of his life. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. He lived out of the speech of the Lord. Listen to that speech. Was devoted to it. Was not without sin yet. He was a sinner. We find out later on that his sons failed to maintain obedience and godliness. And they also strayed from the way of Jehovah. Whether he failed as did Eli in his discipline of them, we know not. But Jehovah God was pleased to raise up this man, a sinner, for His glory and for His honor. And God continues to do so for the sake of His church and for the sake of His glory. As mothers teach our children the Word of God, and as we teach our children to respect, to adore, to obey the Word of God in all their life, as we set before them the wonder of worship, As we teach them, they are not their own, but they belong to their faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. As we set before them the wonder of Christ and Him crucified, we do so with a view to that service that is for Him and for His glory. And there's blessing. God gave peace and joy to Hannah. That, first of all, she hadn't even conceived a child yet. She had finished the prayer. And already, God gives her peace. She experiences the assurance of God's love. Her desire was not just simply to have a child that would then make herself the end of that child's existence. No doubt she was lonely. Only imagine how blessed it would have been for her to have someone in that household with her, with whom she could enjoy communion. So easy it would have been for her selfishly to desire that gift. But Hannah was over able by God's grace to overcome that desire. And she sacrificed her own desire for God's sake. And God gives peace. Beloved, when we look away from self, we look to Christ, we look to God and to His glory, and we submit to God and we submit to God's will. There's peace. And we can testify that. We have been there. We've done that. Our prayers haven't even been answered necessarily in the way that we would desire. And yet God strengthens our faith and God gives us to know through that trial and through that prayer, His assurance. The woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. God used that prayer for her to see that the Lord is pitiful and the Lord is full of tender mercy. Even when our prayers are not answered to what we would desire, God grants that grace. And Hannah experienced that peace and that joy. Now, God must have given Eli to know that Hannah's prayer would be answered in the way of conception. And Eli then assures her of that, and Hannah goes home in the confidence then of God's promise issued through Eli. What a great joy that Jehovah God is sovereign in our lives. And what a great joy to be able to turn to Him in prayer and to know that He hears our prayers and that He grants us what we stand in need of. And that even when His answer is different than that which Hannah received, He's faithful. And when He does answer our prayer in a way that is in accordance to what we would desire, what a wonderful joy fills our hearts as we realize this is God's doing. And He gives us a newborn. 
And He places that one in our arms. And we confess with Hannah, for this child I prayed, and God heard my prayer. And then when that child grows up, and as that child sings the Psalms of Zion, as that child gives expression, confessing faith in Jesus Christ, as that son, that daughter grows and establishes their own home and desires to show forth the praise of God, what rejoicing! And that becomes evident in Hannah in chapter 2 as she sings a beautiful song of joy and thanksgiving. And beloved, God works that joy and that thankfulness also in our hearts. As we confess, it's all of God. It's nothing of ourselves. We're not deserving. And yet God in His mercy is pleased to continue His covenant in our generations for His glory and for His honor. We read, and He worshipped the Lord there. To worship the Lord is to make known the beauty and the glory of God. To make known His majesty and His greatness. It's to acknowledge that Jehovah God is God alone. To worship is the most blessed thing that a person can do on this earth. To worship is to begin the everlasting work of heaven here on earth, as heaven will be to all eternity, worship and praise. The first thing that we read concerning Samuel after his mother drops him off at Shiloh and he's not going to see her again, and he's a young child, is that he worshipped the Lord there. This was the house of God. Asked of God, heard of God, and he already bears the mark of his master. God would be with him, even as he had been with Moses, as he had been with Joseph of old, God's promise of old stood. He shall call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will be with him and honor Him. Beloved, by God's grace, that same promise is that to which we cling. As we respond, as did Samuel, Speak, Lord, for Thy servant heareth. And we call on God. And He answers us. And He is with us in time of trouble. And He gives us the grace to praise and to magnify Him. And may He strengthen us as parents especially, selflessly and sacrificially, to raise up our children for the glory and honor of His kingdom. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, we are weak and we are sinful. We are selfish. Forgive us, Lord, and strengthen us by the wonder of Thy grace in Jesus Christ, that by Thy Spirit we might walk in the way of godliness and holiness, that we might train up our children in the fear and honor of Thy name, and that we might pursue Thy will, and that we might worship now and to all eternity the greatness of the glory of thy honor. Amen.